Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Summer Sounds with episode eight of Shots About Improv. And we are so honored today to have Ken Adams with us as a guest. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Hi, how are you? Yeah, very well. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, we're very happy to have you with us here. And um, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Sure, thank you. Well, my name is Ken Adams. I'm the artistic director of an improvisational theater company called Synergy Theater. We're located here in the San Francisco Bay Area in the United States. I've been improvising for about 32 years now. I started way back in New York in 1989 with a company called Freestyle Repertory Theater that performed theater sports, the famous short form show created by Keith Johnstone. And then we started developing some of our own long form uh, formats. And that led to a whole fascination on my part about improvising full length plays. Before I started improvising, I was primarily interested in playwriting. And when I started improvising and I realized that I could take this thing I love acting and this thing I love playwriting and do them both at the same time on stage in front of an audience, that was really exciting. And I loved short form improvisation, but I did feel that there was so much more potential to this art form that we weren't really tapping into. And nowadays, a whole bunch of people do long form improv and improvised plays. But back in 89, 90, that wasn't really the case. People weren't doing it. So we were a bit on the forefront there. And that led to the approach I developed, which I write about in my book, how to improvise a full length play, the art of spontaneous theater. And that's been my career focus ever since uh, innovating and elevating the art of improvisation so that it can be used to improvise any type of theater one would wish to improvise and really kind of step up so that it has the same qualities and, and the same sense of theatricality as any other type of piece of theater you might see. Hey. Thank you again. And, and also, uh, if I may mention, because I took a, a course with you online about narrative. So um, if you can tell us a little bit more about your courses uh, in real life and, and online. Yeah, thank you very much. So Synergy Theatre has a school of improvisation. We teach classes here in Berkeley, California, locally, and we have a whole bunch of classes online, which, of course, was one of the silver linings to the very hard two and a half years that we all just went through. It allowed me to offer uh, training to people from all over the world who otherwise I would never have met and would never have had the opportunity to uh, to learn from and to play with, including the two of you, which is just awesome. So uh, synergytheater.com, our full online courses are listed. In fact, I'm not quite sure when this is going to be uh, displayed to the public, but we have new classes starting up every six weeks. So whenever you see this, go to synergytheater.com and see what we're offering. We'd love to work with you. <laughs> and you will end up loving Ken as a tutor. He uh, is great. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, so nice. Um, and Ken, today, um, I think we will talk about the topic uh, in this episode, uh, which uh, you really like because you also referred a little bit to it, which is basically the, um, the relationship between structure and being spontaneous. Yeah, I think improvisation is an art form of paradoxes. And one of the main paradoxes that make it so exciting is exactly that. On one hand, the primary mission when you're improvising is to be spontaneous and allow your creativity to be shared with the world unfettered and uncensored. And that is true. That is always true. On the other hand, we are often trying to improvise a certain thing, whether we're doing short form improvisation and we're playing a game like the alphabet game where each line has to start with the next consecutive letter of the alphabet, or whether you're trying to improvise a two act play in the style of William Shakespeare, there, there are certain goals that we set out to improvise. So we have to find a way to be spontaneous 
but at the same time to shape that spontaneity in such a way so that it achieves your goal. And therefore, the artist is in charge of the art rather than just following along whatever happens to take place and hoping that it all works out. So that's the approach that I take. It's this duality of consciousness where you are able to truly be spontaneous and allow your first instinct to make itself uh, aware on stage and yet always within the shape of the structure you're trying to achieve. Uh, I think for, for Mahi and myself, um, this is a very interesting topic because we uh, also teach Doc Cooper, which is a three-act or a five-act um, narrative structure um, created by Martin Boudicker and teach by Martin. Um, and we are really passionate about that. Yeah. So, um, but say the first question, why is the structure important? I think the structure is important because as artists, we have an obligation to the audience to present a certain thing. Now, there can be many, many different things that you care to present, but whatever it is, you, you owe the audience that. And you owe yourself as an artist the ability to create the art that you're setting out to create. So I like to think of the spontaneity issue by pointing out the difference between being spontaneous and being random. And those are not the same thing. Anyone can go out on stage, four people can go out on stage and just say random things. And they might be being spontaneous in a way, but they're not being spontaneous in a way that is helpful to creating a story or creating whatever type of improvisational theater piece they're trying to create. So being random is not enough, right? We have to put limits on randomness in order for it to be spontaneity in the way that is helpful for improvisers. So you, you need to know the structure that you're trying to improvise within so well, so organically, mm -hmm. that you can go on stage and your spontaneity instinctively helps discover the structure. Unless you know that structure well, you can't do that. Um, on the subject of structures, um, could you quote uh, a few a few examples of structures? Say, for example, how you start, how you go into heightening, how you end. Sure. Well, the approach that Synergy Theatre takes, and that's the approach that I write about in the book, is an understanding of the basic dramatic structure of a play, and it basically boils down to the beginning, the middle, and the end. We all know that, but. How do we get from one to the other? What happens in the beginning of a play? How do we travel from the beginning into the middle? What happens in the middle? How do we transition into the end? And then how do we find the end? So it, it, in some sense, it's very specific because there are certain things that we're looking for certain dramatic landmarks that take us from the beginning to the middle to the end. But in another sense, you can see it's wide open. There's a million different stories that can fit within that structure I just laid out. And in fact, you know, every great movie, every great play, every great novel to some extent does fit within that. And that's the other thing about understanding this relationship between spontaneity and structure. Some people see structure as a limitation, but I see it in just the opposite way. Structure is not a limitation. Structure is an opportunity that allows you to express your creativity in ways you otherwise would not have had the need to or the opportunity to. So again, it's uh, the difference between random and between making a certain type of art on purpose. So basically, the very briefly, the way my full length play structure works is we start in the beginning and the purpose of the beginning is to create the routine by which the characters live. Then we travel from the beginning to the middle when one character does something that I call the first significant event that breaks the routine and brings us into the middle. Now that we're in the middle, the job is to raise the stakes in light of that first significant event and increase the risk that the characters face until the main character is faced with a question that determines their fate one way or the other. Mm. 
then that takes us towards the ending in which we discover whether or not the main character is successful in overcoming that major obstacle in their life or not. So beginning, middle and end. And we train ourselves in this type of work in order to have a sense of where we are in the story so that if we find ourselves in the beginning, we understand what the purpose of our offers are at that point. It's to establish the routine, reinforce the routine, raise the stakes should the routine be broken. Then when we feel it's time to move on, we break that routine. So all of that work we just did starts to come into play. And now we raise the stakes based on having broken that routine. So you can see it's really very improvisational. We're building on offers. Synergy Theater um, presents our three rules of improvisation as be spontaneous, make your partner look good, and build on your partner's idea. We think of the story itself as our partner. What is the idea of the story? What does the story want? And how can we all build on that idea by helping the story achieve its next level of development? I love the way that you say the story is also one of our scene partners <laughs> and the story should shine as well. I uh, never heard that before. I think it's uh, really amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that um, as a group, as an ensemble, we train ourselves to think about as opposed to putting the focus on ourselves. We always know as improvisers that our goal is to put the focus on our partner, not think about what we want to do or how we want our uh, character to look or our agenda, but how can we help our partner? It's real interesting to be sitting off on the side watching the story and not thinking about any ideas to come in with, but really watching the story and seeing what the story wants. So, um, you know, in, in Romeo and Juliet, um, if, if the these people hate those people and there are two well, this one young man looking for love the story kind of wants that young man to find someone in that other camp and fall in love right that's the the offer that the story is making and the improvisers need to train themselves to become sensitive to that story so that they can accept those offers um, can I ask you, um, Ken, for example, yeah, the audience um, needs to need, need to be motivated to accept the offers and then be interested in the characters. What happens when uh, you have uh, not a happy ending, but a sad ending? Would the audience be disappointed? No, I think not. Um, my whole premise here is that improvisation is just another way of making plays. It's another way of creating theater. And just like people write comedies and people write tragedies and people write dramas, we can improvise comedies and tragedies and dramas. And if you go out there and you put on a great play for the audience and it has a sad ending, then the audience will love that the same the way they love any other play that has a sad ending. I, I will confess that there is a certain expectation with improvisation that it be light and comic. So I do think there is a legitimate challenge of of managing the expectations of your audience yeah. so that what you are offering them fits with their expectations. Otherwise, it, it, it might be a little challenging for them to go along for the ride. But as long as you manage those expectations, either and probably that will come in the in the way you set it up and in the first couple of scenes of the play. But once you bring the audience into what you're offering and you lean into it um, with real passion and integrity, the, the audience loves theater and the audience will watch your play as long as it's well crafted and well acted. <laughs> It's just one more question, uh, Ken. Uh, a lot of people um, associate improvisation with stand-up comedy. And when you start turning it into a long story, which could be dramatic, not necessarily a funny, they might be disappointed, you think? Well, I, I think that's possible. And again, I think that has to do with managing their expectations. If you build the show as comedy, then you probably owe the audience some comedy. But I will tell you this, um, when, when Synergy Theater performs, we, we do um, push the idea that it's going to be funny. We only 
improvise full length plays in various styles, like in the style of Shakespeare, or we just wrapped up our spontaneous Charles Dickens in the in the style of Charles Dickens. And I will um, say that in our advertising, we we do suggest that this is going to be kind of a comic take on it. And in fact, it is. But our shows, we feel are most successful when they have heart. Um, like, for example, we were doing Spontaneous Charles Dickens the other day, and our opening suggestion, we asked the audience for something the family was celebrating. And it happened to be Passover week, and so someone in the audience said Passover. So it started off with a Jewish family celebrating Passover in 1848 England, and the play went on to deal with what it was like to be Jewish back in England in 1848 and some of the anti-Semitism and alienation that went along with that. Now, I promise you, the audience did not expect us to take their suggestion of Passover and really turn it into an important fabric of the play like that. But we did. And they loved it. It was wonderful. And, and of course, there was still lots of silly improvisation and lots of silly laughter and all of the things that you expect. But underneath the whole thing was this real heart about this character dealing with the way he is not accepted by the people in his community. And, and we stuck to that and we were very proud of the way the audience went with us when we offered the dramatic scenes concerning that. Um, I think everything <clears throat> uh, boils down about thousands of years of storytelling uh, where we as humans learned how you tell a good story and using these concepts and ideas in our improvisation and that's in the structure but within the structure be as spontaneous as you like yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's an interesting point you bring up about storytelling being thousands of years old. And I'll point out this structure that I offer, which is, you know, basically a way to take improvisers from the beginning and the middle into the end is not something that I created or any one particular person created and then said, this is how you must tell a story. It's just the opposite. It's a descriptive process by exposing ourselves to you know, uh, thousands of years of storytelling and plays and seeing what they all have in common and then taking those commonalities and writing them out and saying, OK, here's what all the great plays have in common. So if you want to make a great play, do this <laughs> and it will probably work. So we're not imposing anything on your creativity. We are simply offering an understanding of how human beings tell stories and why they're so powerful. We, we save the other questions for our next yeah. chapter on okay. episode nine. And we thank you very much, uh, Ken, for uh, talking about um, the relationship between structure and spontaneity. And uh, well, we'll see you soon. In episode nine. Thank episode you so nine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye.